So thanks everyone and uh, a warm welcome from my side here from Switzerland. And it's my honor to be here and present you uh, a general overview on RFID technology and what you can do with it. Uh, sorry that I have to speak English, but my Spanish is not so good. So I, I need to refer to English here. So the title of the presentation is Powering Trusted Identities, uh, RFID Technology and Applications. So uh, before I start a few words where I come from, <clears throat> um, I'm leading the product marketing for a business area that's called Identification Technologies. And uh, this is doing RFID-based tags for all sorts of industries. We belong to a company called HID, who is headquartered in Austin, Texas, and spreads across the world with uh, over 4,000 employees. And HID is mostly well known for uh, door access control, like you see on the left screen, uh, you have electronic door locks and uh, watches or key fobs or cards to access it or mobile phones these days. And this is a division of ASA Aploy, uh, who is a Swedish concern who focuses on locks and doors uh, from a shop door up to a hangar door, uh, from mechanical locks up to electronic locks. So whenever it comes to electronic uh, locking, this is HD and the underlying tech, uh, wireless technology called RFID is what we cover. So the agenda for today is uh, technical overview on what is RFID, uh, since I, maybe some of you may not be so familiar with the technology, I have a few slides to explain what this is all about. Then we look in a few special cases like harsh environments, uh, an overview on NFC called near field technology, <coughs> which some of you may be familiar because it's built into most modern phones these days. A uh, quick look at events and public transport, a uh, collection of examples from various industries just to give you an idea what uh, can be done with RFID. Of course, these examples are just selections. There are many more. And finally, a few words about what can be done with active RFID. Most of the presentation is about passive and what's the difference I will explain in the next few slides. So what is RFID? Uh, more or less, it's a more advanced uh, replacement for a barcode. On the left picture, you see a typical barcode scenario. Uh, barcode reads one item at a time. You need to have line of sight. Uh, you need to be able to look at the item. And it has only very limited information. And this is read only. Versus RFID overcomes that. So there is a chip and an antenna. You don't have to have line of sight. You can read multiple items at a time like here, a complete hamper of, of tagged uh, linen that goes through a gate. So the reader is, in this case, these yellow bars here. And you can read and write. So that's a lot of advantages uh, that RFID can bring. The only disadvantage, uh, if you want, is that, of course, it costs more to build such a tag than uh, to print the barcode on, on a piece of paper or plastic. So what components do you need for RFID? You have the tag. In the example here, I'm using a card, like a contactless credit card, that has an antenna and a chip on it, but it could be any form factor. You have a reader. In this case, I'm showing a handheld reader that, that can be carried around. There is also stationary ones, like you have seen on the previous picture. Uh, this reader reads the tag, uh, detects at least a unique serial number, sometimes more uh, uh, additional data and then uh, gives this information to a database where more uh, information about the, the, the business logic is stored. And then there is an applica application that executes the business logic. So these are the main four components of RFID. Here you see a typical example. Yeah, you have maybe tags on these shelves. You have a reader contactlessly reading it and uh, the application in this case on the smartphone doing uh, some intelligent stuff with it. So how does do RFID text look like? Uh, they can be any shape, size, or form. This is examples of, of what RFID text for industrial use case typically look like. 
The most common form is a label, like here on the lower left, you have a chip, uh, an etched antenna, and some substrate, uh, paper or PET, and you, you stick it somewhere, and, and uh, then you can read it contactlessly. Uh, RFID tags are very different. They differ in which chip is in, inside. Chip is, can be seen like a small computer that has the intelligence. The chip is connected to the antenna that depends on the frequency. There are typically three frequencies in RFID called uh, LF, HF, UHF, so low frequency, high frequency, or ultra high frequency. And then there is different shapes, sizes, and materials depending on the use case. Yeah. Um, in general, you distinguish between active and passive RFID. The main difference is uh, the active ones have a battery and the passive ones don't. And with the active uh, battery, of course, there come advantages and disadvantages. The advantage is essentially you have more power, so you get further read range, you can add sophisticated sensors. The disadvantage is uh, the tech costs more to build. The battery at a certain point in time runs out of power, so you either need to replace or recharge it versus a passive tax uh, can work for years and, and dozens of years and, and will not break. Yeah. So quick look at the frequencies. As I said, there are three main frequencies. And if you think about it, as the frequency becomes higher, the amount of data per second increases, so the tax become faster. The radio waves behave more like light. So in UHF, you have problems like reflection or dampening, just if you would use a flashlight. And also the ability to go through material diminishes. I said you in RFID, you don't need line of sight. So uh, you can have something on top of the RFID tag, but it depends which material it is. And the lower the frequency, the more immune the tag is against the material, especially against water. So LF. Uh, here are two examples, looks like this. A uh, very common use case for LF is animal ID, and we will talk later on about animal ID. Read range is not that big, it's maybe uh, up to half a meter. HF, very common for cryptographic uh, applications like access control, payment systems, things like that. And uh, also some industrial use cases. And also if you heard the term NFC, we will talk later on on this. NFC is a subset of HF. So every NFC tag is an HF tag, but not every HF tag is an NFC tag. For UHF, also called RAIN RFID, this is the most common uh, nowadays <coughs> uh, in the industrial environment, at least. Here you have very long reading distance, typically around 10, 10 to 20 meters. So that is good if you want to read uh, items in bulk, like a whole pallet of stuff. Uh, but you also have to be careful. Uh, UHF tags don't work well with water, for example, uh, versus LF tags uh, or HF tags don't care that much. You can also combine the technologies, like you see here is a card with L LF, HF, and UHF in the same card. So if you think you can, you, it's not transparent, you can use all three technologies in one single card that you have available. Maybe for uh, access control in the door, for payment in the cantina, and for accessing the parking lot from your car, all in one card. On this slide, uh, I summarize a bit the properties. So as I said, um, LF is slow, but it's uh, very immune against the environment. UHF is fast, but uh, it's not good with water. and for metal, you basically have to design the tag. If you design it for metal, it works good. If you don't, then it doesn't work at all. And uh, it does not read through metal, whereas LF, you can even read through metal. Not very far, but you can. Yeah. Uh, HF are typically the tags with the highest memory, but most RFID tags only use very little memory and the rest is done in a database. So that's about it, the technology basics. So what are the main advantages? As I said, no need for line of sight. You can read multiple items at once. You can also write data back to the tag, something that you cannot do with a barcode or QR code. You would have to erase the QR code and, and print a new one. You have much higher storage capacity. So RFID tags go up to 64 kilobytes. 
but very common is is 256 bytes or uh, even less depending on the type of tag just for cost reasons primarily they can do cryptography they have a small computer embedded so you can use them for security applications like payment you can add sensors there are sensors that work battery less simply powered by the reader especially for temperature humidity deformation uh, Tags like that exist and they can be built to withstand even a welding torch like you see in the picture. And there can be special features like, for example, an electronic seal that gives you a different status when the seal is broken. On the business side, what are the advantages of RFID? Uh, of course, it's tracking and managing inventory. Essentially, you get the inventory at the press of a button. You don't need to walk around and look at each and every item and scan the barcode. Uh, you improve the data accuracy, you can make your processes faster, you uh, avoid human errors, <clears throat> uh, you can add trust and several other things. So that's typically advantages you get with RFID solutions that uh, are independent of what exactly is the use case and what exactly you are tracking. Uh, so Typically applications, as I said, inventory management, asset tracking, contact payment, contactless payment, uh, access control, <coughs> counterfeit prevention, and supply chain management. From the verticals, more or less, it does not really matter. You can, any vertical in the world or any use case in the world can benefit for, from, H, from RFID. Uh, it's a technology that is not really specific to one particular use case. Now, jumping very quickly to harsh environments. So within all these verticals, there is a lot of so-called harsh environments. So these are environments like you see here on the screen, construction yards, warehouse, manufacturing, gas cylinders, oil and gas, uh, logistics, all these kind of uh, use cases where it's either hot, cold, dusty, uh, tags are uh, impacted, hit by stuff. So, and the construction of RFID text can be made to survive a lot of these. I give you a few examples, uh, yard management. So here you may have a square kilometer or more of, of a construction yard and you need to be able to quickly locate and identify items. So you can imagine they are outside, they are in the desert maybe or in the Arctic. They are exposed to all sorts of weather. Uh, they are clashed against each other. So, uh, the techs need to withstand that when they are supposed to identify the item. Uh, there is standards to measure, for example, impact. On the left-hand side, you see an example of an especially impact-resistant tag with a metal bar around it. <clears throat> uh, this one is one that is supposed to be welded on uh, a steel keg in this case. So uh, very good methods to, to make tags rugged. In explosive environments, there is certain standards that are applicable to it, uh, like ATEX or ISEX, that define that the, uh, a tool, a machine, a reader, or, or a tag is uh, eligible to be used in explosive environments. This does not have to be just an oil rig, as you see here. It could be a mine, it could be a mill. So there is different explosive environments, gas stations, uh, where you need products that are designed to work in such environment. And then they are also typically marked with the specification directly on the tag so that you see it when you are on site, that this is a proper defined tag or reader or whatever uh, the powered equipment is. Extreme temperature environments, a uh, very common use case that we see. Uh, we have customers that put uh, tags on, on aircraft engines and the tags need to withstand flames or extreme heat. Also paint shop processes are typically very high heat, uh, which need to be, or autoclave processes in the, in the healthcare industry uh, that need to be covered. On the other hand, what you see on the right side and also here, these are medical probe cylinders that go into liquid nitrogen and are stored for many years in deep uh, freeze cold with samples. So here, when you tag these probe cylinders, you get much more efficient in inventorize uh, what you have <clears throat> in the tank. 
um, how long it is there. You don't have to take it out to make an inventory. Uh, you can read it while it's still in the, in, in the vapor zone. So it's much faster and much more accurate than any barcode solution you could, you could put into deep freeze. Also no problem with frosting and things like that. Washing environment, also very common. Here you see an example of a real power wash. So the tech needs to be robust enough uh, to withstand that uh, high heat, uh, almost cooking water in extremely high pressure. Uh, also very often there is disinfection with caustic soda uh, or other chemicals that uh, the proper tags can withstand. Here, for example, that's a laundry tag that is of course made to withstand all the different laundry detergents that uh, people may encounter in their use cases. Also a, a quite unique use case here that is uh, an example of a seal tag. A seal tag, I mentioned them before, they have the special property to, once you fix them, you cannot remove them without breaking them. And uh, this picture here shows a, a mine site where they, they put ore into these bags. So there is a ton of ore or more in, in one such a bag. And here the mine wanted to make sure that the, nobody steals the ore between the mine and the refinery and puts worthless rocks into the bag. So after the bag is filled, they close it with the tag. And then uh, at the refinery, they see whether the tag is still intact. When the tag is still there, then nobody has opened the bag. Uh, if somebody has cut the hole in the bag, uh, of course you would see. But when the bag is intact and the tag is intact, you can be sure that uh, the original content is still in there. And it doesn't have to be a mine bag. You can imagine it can be any container with any content, or you can put the, the tag directly on the content. We have cases for jewelry, for example, or weapons. Uh, whenever you want to uh, remove uh, or make sure that nobody has, uh, has broken uh, the seal, then and you want to automatically read that uh, contactlessly, then such a seal tag is the, is the proper choice. Okay, um, now from this use case examples, the next chapter is near field communication or NFC. What is NFC? It's, as I said, uh, that's I think the definition from Wikipedia, uh, is a set of standards for smartphones and similar devices to establish radio communication with each other by touching them or bringing them into close proximity. So it's really intentionally called near field communication. It's meant to not have 10 meter read range. It's meant that you have to have an, to do an explicit act of bringing the phone to the tag or bringing two phones together. And you show that you really want these two things to communicate to each other. Uh, that's the purpose of NFC. There is, three operation modes. One is called card emulation. So here the phone simulates a card and the phone talks to things like you see here, a payment terminal, or this is a door reader, right? The payment terminal normally works with, with contactless credit cards or contactless payment cards. And the terminal does not notice a difference whether you bring your phone when it's properly configured or you bring a card. For the terminal, it's the same thing. Same here for the access control door lock. The door lock doesn't know that you have a phone. The phone simulates a card and says, hey, here I am, this is my proper credential and it lets you in. But NFC can work the other way around, which is the reader writer mode. So in this case, you have a passive NFC tag and the phone is the reader. Here the phone is the tag. Here the phone is the reader. It's still, it could be the same phone. Right? It's just different modes of operation. So here you use that for reading posters, for advertising, uh, for triggering some functions on the phone <clears throat> that are programmed on the tag or the device. Yeah? And then finally you have the so-called peer-to-peer mode where you bring two intelligent devices together, for example, to transfer uh, uh, business cards, to transfer images, or simply to quickly establish a more powerful connection. So you could bring two phones together, they, they exchange a key 
and agree that from now on they will talk Bluetooth or Wi-Fi, but in a secure way. Uh, and this is, for example, uh, used in uh, for digital driving licenses or stuff like that, where you as a user would show your digital driving license to a police officer and you tap your phone uh, with the phone of the police officer, they establish a secure channel, then you can take the phones apart and uh, still your, your license can be checked. So mainly in this presentation, we talk about this reader writer mode here. When you think what can be an NFC tag, basically anything. You have seen the various form factors. All of these form factors can be made an NFC tag as long as they are HF and they are properly programmed in the NFC data format. So as I said, every NFC tag is also an HF tag, uh, but not vice versa. A very common use case of NFC tag is uh, convenience. So essentially NFC replaces a QR code. So you, if you man, imagine a smart po or a poster like this, instead of having to take an image of the QR code where you need to launch your camera app, you need to have enough light to do it, uh, you need to see it, you can just hold your NFC enabled phone against the tag and it, everything else happens automatically because the operating system knows how to deal with an NFC tag. And all modern uh, smartphones know that. Apple iPhones do that since version seven and Android phones uh, do that essentially since uh, Android four. Now for security, uh, there you have to think a bit further. You, as we said, you put the URL in, so you replace the QR code. Like a QR code, you can copy an NFC tag very easily. It looks complicated, but it is not. You download one of many free NFC apps from the app stores of Google or Apple. Uh, you tap the first tag, you say copy, you tap in the second empty tag and you have copied the tag. Very easy. You don't need to know any programming or any RFID for that. But since it's just a URL, you don't even have to copy a tag. You can just remember the URL and, and store it in your browser favorites. The server in a normal setup does not distinguish whether you are coming from an NFC tag or whether you are just know the URL. Now, if you do a promotion and you want to get as many people as you can on your website, this does not really matter. But when it's about security and you want to make sure that the person who taps the NFC tag is really in front of this particular tag, then you need something else. Mm -hmm. And this is where uh, trusted NFC tags come in. So here you have a special NFC tag that has some cryptographic code in it. And it, if you want, it works like a, a one-time password generator for your VPN or your e-banking. So the, the tag, every time you tap it, it generates a secure code that is appended to the URL that, that changes every time you tap. You need an NFC enabled device. This device is just a standard device. There is no special app needed because all what the device sees is a URL with a parameter. The device goes to the website of the brand, or whatever it is, that's the business logic. That's typically the customer, could be, don't know, any, any consumer brand that you want. And this website strips off the parameter, sends it to a service that says, yes, it's valid or it's not valid and gives it this information back to here. So this website could then uh, prevent access or it could give different information like this product is not authentic or whatever. And uh, therefore uh, work on this business logic. So quick illustration on how that works. So you tap with your phone on the tag, you get the URL with the code at the end, you send it to the cloud, the cloud says, yes, it's true. Yeah? You tap again, you get another code at the end and it's again valid. If you use the same code again, because you copied the URL into your browser favorites or you published it on social media to say, hey, see here, I get some, some special, I don't know, free song download or whatever. It does not work. Every URL only works once. Yeah. So if you are back at the tag and you tap it again, you get another code and this code can be verified. 
So when you imagine you build a tag that is physically like the seal tag in a way that when you, you put it somewhere, you glue it somewhere or you hang it somewhere, and when you remove it, you break it, and then it does not work anymore. What you get is a proof of presence. It's when you see a valid tab, you know that this person has been in front of the tag, and you know that the tag has not been broken. Otherwise, you would not see a valid tab. And this can be used for uh, a bunch of use cases. It can be used for brand protection. So if you embed a tag, for example, in a bag, and you properly uh, program it and properly embed it, then you can educate the consumer to say, hey, please tap your phone here, and you give the consumer additional information about this product, uh, maybe the option to register himself for extended warranty, and, and prove that this is an authentic product, which can also help the consumer when he wants to sell the product to somebody else uh, later on. Um, customer loyalty. So, for example, you, we had cases where people do sweepstakes in, in, in an office, in, uh, in a shop environment, and you want to make sure that the people who participate in the sweepstake actually are in the shop and not just publish the sweepstake URL somewhere on social media. And uh, finally, secure proof of presence, proving where the person is. So here, some example use cases would be home healthcare. So you give the patient a tag that he cannot easily remove or uh, you put it in the patient's flat. And when the nurse comes and visits him, uh, she taps her phone on, on, the, uh, on the trusted tag of the patient or the, or the home and checks in and checks out in a trusted way to prove uh, the time that she has been there. And that's of course has an impact to billing. Uh, guard tours, uh, same similar use case. So you place tags uh, around a guard to a route and you want to make sure that the guard actually visits the route and not just says that he has been there because it was raining outside and the guard didn't do what he was supposed to do. Uh, with such a trusted tag uh, solution, you can make sure that every time you see the tab, you know exactly when it was and where it was. And similar use case, again, for maintenance and, and inspection, when you have, for example, multiple pieces like uh, air condition devices or fridges to maintain, they all look the same and you can uniquely authenticate each one of them, uh, can make a protocol on, on what needs to be done or what has been done and also automate the billing of these services. So three chapters more to go. This is a brief one, RFID for events and public transport. So in events and public transport, you typically have tickets. The tickets are often printed on paper. Sometimes they have a max stripe. Uh, Nowadays, more and more, these physical tickets uh, become either uh, RFID-enabled tickets or directly digital tickets on a mobile phone. There is different standards available. There is also a lot of custom solutions available. But uh, over time, as the solutions mature, it's getting more and more uh, uh, concentrated and interoperable, which is very helpful, for example, to use the same mobile ticket in different cities or for different services. Digital tickets have a lot of advantages over physical tickets. Uh, they can be modified on the fly. Uh, they, they, you can, with the cloud, uh, you can, for example, upgrade the ticket. The consumer could, could uh, top up the ticket with special features. Uh, the issuing authority can manage the ticket when it's necessary. The ticket knows it that it has been verified and could trigger uh, specific actions. Uh, it can be location dependent because the phone knows where it is. Uh, you can transfer it uh, online, but you can also prevent that it's transferred. And it works, um, it can work as a QR code, but it can also work uh, as a NFC card emulation. So then it acts, uh, the phone acts as a replacement of a card, just as I explained before. Good, so much for uh, all the technology and already some use case examples. In my next chapter, I 
want to spark your fantasy a bit and, and show some typical examples of where RFID is used. The most common use cases and the most widespread use cases of RFID are these. So you have access control, I guess all of you know, or have been in a hotel, you get the card, you don't have to insert it somewhere, you just hold it against the reader and the door opens. Uh, very common use case, same for contactless payment. You have a, a payment card, you hold it against the terminal and you do payment. Passports, all modern passports have some electronic component in, in there, very often shown in form of this chip here in the passport. So it's the passport, if you like, is also an RFID tag in this case. Yeah? So there is a chip in there, there is an antenna in there. The shape of the passport is different to a card or some of the industrial tags you have seen, but the idea is, is really the same. And finally, retail inventory. So this is where uh, the cheap labels come in. So here, vendors are typically fighting about uh, fractions of a cent in, in the price of the tag. Uh, but the idea is to tag as many goods as possible for like every shirt gets an individual tag. That's why the price point needs to be so low uh, to get very quick inventory and make sure that all the stuff you want to have on the shelf is on the shelf and you very quickly notice when somebody, something is missing. Now, for some more specific use cases, uh, one example is uh, animal ID pet. So in many countries, uh, tags are injected into pets, like cats or dogs mostly, also horses. It's a small glass tag and that allows the veterinarian to uniquely identify the animal, uh, to get the treatment history, to uniquely identify the owner if the pet is found. Uh, there is also use cases with pigeons for races, for example. So you want to make sure the pigeon who started uh, and is counted at the, at the finish is really the same pigeon. And you can do that with uh, basically a seal tag uh, around the leg of the, of the, of the pigeon. For animals that are eaten, like cows, pigs, sheep, and so on, uh, farm animals, uh, also animal ID is very important. Many countries have legislations where uh, uh, animals get, for example, earmarks or uh, also get uh, injected tags that uniquely identify the animal to make sure in which farm it has uh, grown up, what treatment it got, maybe what uh, illnesses it had, and so on. And this goes on for the whole traceability of the food chain up until uh, uh, the food is, is sold in the, in the retail store. Yeah. So here, for example, these meat hooks uh, are from a project where every meat hook uh, has a tag in it. So it, it's identifying the, 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 the piece of meat that is processed through the whole process hanging on the hook. Next use case, smart toolbox. So here you see a, a toolbox for high-end uh, tools for aircraft maintenance. And here you want to make sure that uh, the toolbox is complete. No tool is missing. You want to make, you want to know who uh, used the tools. And if something's missing, uh, who missed to bring it back. So in this case, uh, for example, there is two applications. One is a reader here where the worker identifies with his employee badge to identify like an access control system that he is authorized to use these tools. Then the box will open and inside the box there is another RFID reader that uh, reads the small tags that are fixed to the tools. And uh, so the box itself can verify uh, that the tool set is complete and if something's missing, what is missing and who has checked in and who has checked out uh, this stuff. Next use case, I promised you there is a big variety. Yeah? Uh, here it's about kegs. So the, these types of tags, they are welded on, on the upper part of the steel keg to make every keg individually identifiable. The idea is that you track the life cycle, you uh, automate it in the processing, you know it's just empty, full, what beer is in it, uh, what should go in to whom it should ship, uh, what's the age of the keg, has it been, has it been washed and disinfected properly, uh, is it at the end of his life. Um, and most important, you see when you load all these, they all look the same, 
So if a wrong pellet is loaded, the whole truck is red when it moves, the, when it leaves the premises. So you can find out immediately when there is a wrong pellet on the truck and stop the truck and fix it before the truck ends up with the wrong beer at the customer, maybe hundred miles later and, and you have a problem with the customer. So that's the typical use case for this, for this text. Here it's about maintenance. So you wanna identify which, uh, how long which component has been in this train. And instead of doing a lot of paperwork and ha having hard to read license plates like this, you put the tag, it can be dusty and dirty, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Medical applications, I won't go into each of these. Typically for medical applications, what RFID is used to tag medical consumables like filters or drills, uh, medical probes, and the use case is very often to say, um, is it authentic? Uh, what's the intended operation? Um, has it been disinfected since the last patient to whom it should be built? Do I have enough inventory? Uh, these kinds of things. Is it the right tool for the right uh, operation? Uh, and all these kinds of things can very easily be done when you have uh, tagged equipment or tagged cartridges and the reader in, uh, for example, this operation tool or this uh, vaporizer uh, or this uh, autoclave system. Next use case, laundry. This is a, <clears throat> uh, an example where uh, the laundry of a hotel is tagged. Uh, here you see a napkin with the embedded tag inside the napkin. And the dirty linen and, and other stuff here is, is put in, in the machine together with, with tagged clothing of the employees. And uh, here on the conveyor belt auto automatically identifies uh, what type of uh, laundry it is. So is it a, is it a shirt or is it a, a napkin? And then depending on that, it, it blows it from the conveyor belt into one of these hampers. Then every hamper is then filled only with one type of, of laundry, which corresponds to a washing machine on the other side that is programmed to this particular washing process. So it's a fully automated sorting of, of, of dirty linen and laundry. And on the other side, when the clean laundry is packed together, uh, especially when it's personal clothing, the RFID is used to ensure that only uh, clothing of one person goes into one bag and nothing is mixed between, between persons. Fueling automation, uh, here the use case is uh, efficient uh, fueling. So you don't, uh, especially for fleet vehicles like trucks or boats or uh, excavation machines or things like that, uh, the driver goes to the gas station. It doesn't have to fill out any paperwork. It just fills his truck in this case. The truck, uh, uh, the reader is here on the fueling nozzle. It will read the tag of the truck, which cannot be removed. And it will authenticate the truck. It will know whether it's the correct fuel. It will know how much fuel has been filled in and the billing is automated and the driver can just fill and, and drive away. And it also helps against uh, fraud because the nozzle doesn't give you any fuel if it's not uh, close to the, to the tag. So you cannot fill a canister when it's not allowed uh, and, and claim you have filled the truck with it. Yeah. Smart toys, also very common uh, use case to make the toy intelligent. Uh, so every toy gets a tag embedded and then uh, it's automatically identifiable by whatever the game board or, or uh, the PlayStation of the friend and, and bring up uh, the proper context or song or whatever it is. Anti-counterfeiting use case, you remember the, the bag I was showing before. Here it's about coin grading. So there is a company <clears throat> who does that in US for collectibles and proves that these are authentic coins or baseball caps or whatever. Uh, and here, this is sealed, a sealed housing with an embedded uh, trusted tag in it, just like I explained before, that allows you with NFC to authenticate, uh, in this case, the coin. Finally, race course entry. 
so here it's about ticketing and uh, mobile tickets and RFID tickets, just as I explained before. So finally, I want to talk a little bit about active tags. So these tags have batteries, and most of the time you refer to them as beacons. Two main use cases we see here is location services and uh, industrial monitoring. There is certain verticals who take more advantage of these than others, at least um, in today's scenarios. One of them is healthcare. And in the boxes below, you see a bit on, on what they do with it. So here a lot is around uh, location services, wayfinding, uh, duress alerts, um, tracking assets, finding beds, finding mobile uh, healthcare equipment. So, and simply save time on, on finding things. Uh, similar enterprise smart building, um, <clears throat> optimize here, it's mostly about optimizing workflows. Uh, there is also the option with location services to do contact tracing. So in times of COVID, uh, this is for some companies a big issue where you, you wanna know who is close to whom else for how long, so that you, if there is a COVID outbreak, you can easily identify uh, and quarantine the, 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 the proper people. Uh, also mastering here is listed as a use case. Imagine a big site like a refinery, there is contract workers going in, doing the turnaround and maintenance. And if there is an alert, you wanna make sure that uh, you got all the people and nobody's missing, or if somebody's missing, you know who it is and where it is. Yeah. Uh, also very common use case to location services. Um, there are different ways to do it. Indoor, it's mostly done with Bluetooth. So you put anchors or, or, or gateways on known locations. You have the beacons traveling between these anchors and then you, the system can triangulate where, where the beacon is and therefore the item that is attached to the beacon being it a person or a piece of equipment. Outdoor, uh, normally for, especially for larger areas, we use GPS, which does not work well in indoor. And uh, you may use uh, technologies like LoRaWAN uh, to bridge several kilometers of distance without having to put access points uh, every few meters. For condition monitoring, there is two options. One is uh, what we call status monitoring. So that's the simpler option. Essentially, you put the sensor beacon on, on a piece of motorized equipment and you measure is it moving and is it hitting. Uh, and then you, you know whether it's running or not running <clears throat> uh, and, and whether the temperature is still okay. And that's very easy to monitor, for example, fridges or escalators wirelessly without having to put expensive uh, wireless technology directly into the device. Any, any cheap motor can be tracked with a beacon over there. The more sophisticated way is condition monitoring. So here, the beacon, uh, in addition to, to, to motion and temperature, also senses vibration. And there is some artificial intelligence software behind that, for example, can be trained you put it on, on the motor, you let it run for a week or so, and the system learns what is a normal type of vibration. And then you put the threshold and you will get an alert when the vibration is out of the normal scope. The idea is uh, that this helps you detect uh, faults before they actually happen, because it's always cheaper, for example, in a manufacturing line to shut it down and replace the defect part before it's completely broken at the time that suits you, for example, when you have only two shifts instead of three, three shifts, then you could replace it in the third shift versus when it breaks during the day when production runs at full speed, uh, it's a lot more costly to, to fix the problem then. There is three foundational components. There is beacons, um, in this case, Bluetooth beacons, but as I said, there is also LoRa, uh, for example, devices. And like RFID tags, they can be very different form factors. You know, it could be a wristband, it can be uh, this lipstick that is stewed somewhere, it can be a key fob, it can be a badge. In this case, this is a badge holder that takes a normal ISO card with or without RFID 
as a badge. And in addition, it's a beacon and it has a duress button. So when you press that button for three seconds, it will raise an alert and somebody and you call automatic for for uh, for help and 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 uh, maybe the uh, the, secu the security of the company can can help you. Um, these are examples for the gateway devices that pick up the signals from these devices, transfer them to Wi-Fi or to, to LAN. And then there is a piece of software at the end that does these calculations of positioning it on a, on a dot, uh, the dot on the map, sorry, or uh, analyzing the vibration. And uh, then typically on top of that, there is another piece of software by uh, system integrators or, or vertical vendors that actually do then the full solution for a particular use case like the hospital. Yeah. So technology vendors like us uh, typically provide what we call solution enabling. So we take care of the complex calculations to put the dot on a map or to say it's out of the threshold, but the business logic is then done uh, uh, by an integrator <clears throat> to or by the customer himself uh, to build into the workflow of, of this particular customer. So that's the end of my uh, presentation today. I hope uh, I could raise your interest on in RFID and hopefully tell you a few things you didn't know yet. Here you find my contact details and I also want to point out we do have an integration partner in Mexico. Electrinet, so if you have a, a project there, they are more than happy to help and to know about all these technologies I have just presented. That's the end of my talk. Thank you very much for your attention and I'm open for questions. Thank you, Mr. Richards. Agradecemos a Richard Freider por su presencia y aporte para con este evento. Y con esto damos por iniciada la sesión de preguntas y respuestas. How can RFID solution increase security in printed documents such as birth certificates, licenses? Uh, it's the same thing as <coughs> uh, mentioned before. You need a cryptographic tag to do that. So, uh, for example, like the trusted tag or any uh, other cryptographic application, like uh, like it's used in mobile ticketing systems. Typically, this is an HF technology. Uh, when you are talking about printed documents like a birth certificate or your university certificate. Uh, there is basically two options to put the RFID tag there. Either you stick it on, then you can use any document. But uh, if you want to prevent forging, you need to have a tag that breaks when you remove it. Otherwise, it could, uh, of course, there is a way to remove it from one document, put it on another document. Uh, so that's one thing to consider. There is also the option to embed RFID in paper. So uh, we do have solutions for that. But uh, of course, that makes the paper uh, costly, especially in low volume, since it's a highly sophisticated process to, to embed RFID into the paper directly. Do you have any integration with blockchain and, and RFID NFC? Uh, HRD ourselves, uh, we don't use blockchain, but our tags are used by partners who then use blockchain. So we are, we are primarily, as I said, a hardware manufacturer. So we take care of the RFID portion uh, of it to provide the cryptography and the hardware to be with all the physical parameters that, we, that I mentioned. Uh, and then some, uh, a system integrator uh, that uses an authentication mechanism uh, for blockchain would take that. And there is a few vendors that do that and I'm, I'm happy to give you the information if you send me an email uh, on that. Any other question? 
alguien más de nuestra audiencia que tenga alguna pregunta para el señor Richards con base a su conferencia? Ok, if not, uh, thanks a lot for your attention. I was honored to be uh, at this event in, in, in Antics today. And if you have any more questions, feel free to email me or Electrinet, and we are happy to help you. Thank you. Thanks to you, Mr. Richard. Have a nice day. Thank you. Goodbye. Con esto damos por finalizada la conferencia, potenciando identidades confiables, tecnologías y aplicaciones impartida por Richard O'Freider. Y nuevamente agradecemos su presencia y aporte para Conentix. Del mismo modo, agradecemos el apoyo de Cinex, Demologística, Tres Factorial, Aritmo, Megabilidades, Netcon, Secretaría de Desarrollo Económico Sustentable, Hospitalidad y Turismo de León, que hacen que Entix llegue a todos y cada uno de los presentes el día de hoy. Les recordamos también que el día de mañana a las 20 horas tendremos el evento de networking en La Cocineta, en León, Guanajuato. Espacio que conecta ideas, proyectos y empresarios. Continuaremos nuestro programa en punto de las 13.45 horas con el taller impartido por Gilberto Vicente de Cinex. Tenernos. El futuro se construye hoy en Guanajuato. Tu trabajo contribuye al clúster automotriz más importante de Latinoamérica. Nos mantenemos como uno de los principales exportadores agroindustriales. Somos líderes a nivel mundial para cuero y calzado. Tú fortaleces la región como el epicentro del turismo de negocios. Nuestra naturaleza es estar en movimiento. No te detengas, sueña, crea y diviértete. Porque el futuro lo creamos hoy. Cámara Nacional de la Industria Electrónica de Telecomunicaciones y Tecnologías de la Información.